2011. 2013. Wow, I'm asleep. <laughs> <laughs> That's two years. Been doing this for so long. Do you video guys get that? Oh no. <laughs> so yes, this is 2013. In case you're watching back on YouTube land. Um, so housekeeping, please sign up for lightning talks. We've only filled five of them, and we need another five at least to make it a good hour's worth of uh, lightning talks. So yeah, please do that. Uh, other than that, uh, I shall introduce our next speaker. Uh, it's always good when we get someone sort of outside of the free and open source software community to come and speak at this conference. Uh, if you have been in the iPhone and iOS development community, you'll recognise Mark from Coco Heads in Sydney, as well as being a convener of the Swipe conference. Um, today he's going to be talking about embedding everything in everything for fun and profit. Please make Mark welcome. Thank you. I like to think of myself as a free and open source alumnus. If you search the, uh, the, the Perl um, uh, contributor commits really carefully, you'll find a very small number from me. Um, so embedding everything in everything. Now, let's see if this is working. Excellent. Um, OK, so thankfully, the, I mean, you guys would all be with me on this that um, you know, the, the, the days of one tool for every uh, is is firmly um, firmly been left in the 90s. Um, so so the, the the whole concept of you know using the right tool for the right job is not something you have to sell anymore. It's it's sort of an established separate thing. But I'd like to to take that another step further. And we, we still tend to pick um, you know maybe a, a, a an overarching language for a project because it best suits that project. Um, but then there's always little parts of that project that would be better at something else. Or maybe, maybe even there's sort of, you've got this sort of schizophrenic project that would be great. Um, you know, one why it's painful, another or this doesn't perform or whatever. So my aim is, is, uh, is combinatorial nirvana, embedding everything inside everything. Or um, something that might get more, uh, more traction on Hacker News is E-cubed. Um, <laughs> And, and before I get too stuck into it, a small admission. I, uh, when I submitted my talk request to Chris, I thought the talks were an hour, um, not 25 minutes. So there's going to be uh, probably a, a little more inspiration than actual code. But if I go quickly, we'll get to the real code. So what am I talking about embedding? Um, so, so like I said, the, the, the <laughs> conceptually, this is from a real talk, by the way. Um, Conceptually, the, the idea is, you know, with, even within one program, even within one running application, there are, there are different tasks that, that are better expressed, more conveniently expressed, more performance in, in different languages. So one obvious example is, is SQL, right? But that's not what I'm talking about. Um, not because it's not a good idea, but because uh, you talk to SQL as a different process through some kind of inter-process communication. But what I'm talking about is, is having uh, multiple languages inside of your process. Um, one of the reasons why I want to do that is, is it seems really hard and really complex and the kind of thing that, that we would ignore. Um, but it, it's not really that hard. So it's often the case in my experience that to simplify things you first have to be willing to enter into a higher level of complexity and that sort of seems, seems confusing. Um, so you mostly we're talking about von Neumann machines, right? Does anyone here program on a, something that's not a von Neumann or Harvard architecture computer? Sometimes, okay. There, there, there are, they, they exist, but the, so that's von Neumann on the left there, uh, and uh, Robert Oppenheimer on, on the right. Um, so for those of you who, who aren't sort of super familiar with it, uh, let's have a quick look at the, the von Neumann machine. And this is basically what our computers are, right? We have, we have memory, which has um, code and, and data. And of course, in the Harvard architecture, it might be split, but let's talk about that. We have some sort of logic in the, our CPU. We have a set of registers, which are you know, our super fast little discrete slots of memory. And we have an instruction pointer, which tells the processor you know, what bit of code to execute next. And, and execution, basically all the, all the logic part of our processor can do is uh, it really does three kinds of things. It, it can do something with um, 
registers, might add them together, might move them around, it can do something with memory, move them in and out of registers, and it can do something with the instruction pointer, it can jump to another location. So the last one, the jump, is, is, uh, is obviously the, the secret to us being able to call functions. Um, so how functions are called, how they receive and return data is called, is known as the calling convention. And, and it's a convention purely because, you know, it, ultimately you're running code on a CPU, you can do whatever you want. You can jump all around, you can stuff whatever you want in the registers. But if you're going to do that, then, of course, you need to document and understand very carefully exactly what's going where. And that's what you do in assembly programming. And fortunately, we don't have to do that. So, um, in most cases, there's a standard calling convention described by a CPU vendor for that CPU which in most cases is followed by the operating system and in most cases is followed by the compiler of your particular language. Um, so let's look at quickly at what that is. Uh, okay, so here's another way of representing uh, the von Neumann architecture. It's, uh, you can tell we're getting more serious because they now have square edges on the, uh, not, not round edges. Um, so we've got the same things, we've got the registers, the instruction pointer and a code. And the calling convention is simply that uh, we, we say, okay, here's a set of registers and, and here's what they're for. So we have, uh, you know, maybe the first two arguments that get passed into our function. Um, we have the return value, which is where we put the value when our function exits. Um, and we have a stack pointer for, you know, a particular language of choice where the stack is, is stored. Um, and there's, there's obviously, you know, different, different uh, complexities, but that's pretty much how how it works. So our code that gets compiled down to machine language code, you come in and out of functions, um, there's a little bit of preamble that means that when your function runs it can just get its arguments and it all sort of works. So on the, when we look at it at this level, it really doesn't matter at all what language your code, whether it's you know interpreted or compiled, it doesn't matter how it works as long as it's sending, you know, as long as it's getting its argument from the same place and returning it from the same place and it's obviously compiled to run on your particular architecture, it doesn't really matter. So there's kind of not really any, any um, logical complexity. It, it's, um, it should all just work. And in fact, it's even easier than that because um, now if you didn't have the same calling convention between a bridge, you would have to kind of move stuff about with assembler. Um, now, fortunately, a whole heap of stuff we do is all based on C. So, so we don't need to worry about that because obviously the calling convention is the same. Um, if you have a situation where you don't have everything that's say built in C, maybe using Java and something else, there's often some kind of foreign function interface like Java has JNI so that you can call out to C functions and vice versa. So that's just a little bit of background to hopefully um, sort of demystify what's, what's going on under our um, you know, third generation language hoods. Um, so let's look at, at, at uh, an example of, of doing just this. So, so the examples I'm going to look at, I'm, I'm assuming I've, I've got a, a C-based application, um, which you know, might be a GUI, could be a web server, uh, and I want to embed um, uh, some kind of you know, scripting language. Um, so let's look at, at Ruby first. So uh, assuming I've already linked in LibRuby and I've done some setup, um, I've got some C code here and I've got a bit of Ruby code here and here's what I do. Now Ruby is, is purely uh, OO for those of you who don't know much about Ruby. So this funny Ruby top self thing here um, is purely to get kind of the main namespace. So normally what you would do is you'd pass an, an object in there but I've just defined something in the main namespace. Um, so uh, Ruby has this concept where uh, uh, to identify methods and, and you know um, hash slots and things like that. They have this this internal ID, which is kind of just you can think of it like a like a string. Uh, but we need to convert from a string to that that ID, and that's we need that because the RB fun call method takes an object or a namespace and uh, a um, this ID and some some flags and calls it. So so this this will actually work. This is all you need to do. And uh, in this case, because the function has a side effect, I don't need to worry about returns or anything. And that will work. That's pretty easy. Right. Um, Perl. Same thing. We've, we've linked with libperl. I don't know why I'm looking backwards because it's right here. Uh, and Except it doesn't really work if I put my laser pointer here. But I'm sure you can read it. So 
uh, we have call PV, which means um, so there's a whole. Uh, you'll notice in, in anything you try, in any especially scripting languages that are designed for embedding or or vaguely designed for embedding. Um, there's a whole bunch of ways to do the same thing. But so in this case, pull, call PV means we're passing in the name of of a Perl uh, subroutine as a string, as a C string, uh, and G void there means we're calling in void context. We don't care about the return value. Again, same thing. That's all we have to do. Uh, tickle. Does anyone here use tickle? Good. Um, so the tickle. The, the reason why I have these three, and we'll, we, I'll use these three a, few, a bit, is uh, firstly because I have experience in embedding all these three in, inside other things. Um, uh, but also specifically, I, I like including tickle because tickle was intentionally designed for embedding. It was designed as a language to be embedded inside other things. Um, which is which th is the reason why I came across it is it's embedded in a web server called AOL server, which used to be called Navi server, and now it's called something else. Uh, and that was made in like the 80s or 90s. Um, and at the time, it was basically the only option if you wanted something that you could do that you could embed a scripting language multi-threaded into a into a C process. So same thing here. Uh, we uh, to, to pass into the tickle evaluate object. Um, now, a tickle is kind of, you could think of it like a functional programming language, for those of you that don't know it. Think of it like. Um, so, so basically we're passing in a, in a, in a uh, uh, it's, it's, it's prefix notation like Lisp or something. So um, in the case where we're just calling a function, all we do is pass in the, uh, an object which is, which is that function that gets byte compiled and stuff. Same thing, all pretty easy, right? So far we've, we've, we've made a C program that will call some other languages. Super easy. Except we haven't actually done anything apart from calling a function that has some side effects, which is not very interesting. So let's talk about um, something where we're going to, uh, you know, we, we're going to kind of stretch our friendship with the calling convention. We're going to send some arguments in and get some returns out. So again, Ruby. Okay, so now we're getting a little bit more complicated. We've got uh, the same, this line up here is the same. We're getting our ID, which is the, the you know, the name of the, of the function. Uh, and we're going to pass in an argument. So in, in Ruby, everything in, in terms of the C API, everything is this type of value. Um, of course, in Ruby, like in, in a lot of scripting languages, you can kind of pretend that there aren't differences between types. But in fact, in the, the back end for performance, of course, there are numbers and, and, and whatnot. In fact, actually, sorry, in, in Ruby, of course, at the front end, there's, there's the, all the different object types. But there's a single there's a single C type here, which is just sort of like an opaque object from our C point of view. But so we can make one of these Ruby objects values uh, from um, rbstrnew. I feel like it feels a bit like PHP, doesn't it? Everything's just this function. Um, rbstrnew for Dave. And uh, we're going to call this function. And exactly like you would imagine with C, I get a return, which is an object. And I can um, call this again, this Ruby API string value C str to get a C string for that Ruby object, and it's all really easy. Um, now, it, things get a little bit harder when you have a, a language like Perl where, where we can have um, multiple return values. And in fact, the, the Perl codes, the Perl C code to do the same thing is, is quite a lot more complicated. Um, so, uh, first of all, this DSP thing, kind of forget about that for the moment, but uh, it's, it's declaring a stack pointer variable. Um, this, it's basically declaring this SP variable here. Now this enter save and save temps, and you'll still also see there's a, a corresponding down here, free temps and leave. That's exactly analogous inside, uh, um, you know, Perl or, or Python or what have you of your um, your curly braces giving you the context. So if I create within the, um, the enter and the save temps and the put back and sorry the free temps and the leave uh, if I've if I've created a Perl variable and it doesn't have any more reference counts then it'll get freed there so it's exactly like having my curly braces around it which gives me a bit of safety that uh, I can call a function and know that everything's going to get dealt with it cleared up um, now so a big difference here and you'll see this in some other scripting languages in, in the C backends the way that we interact with functions is we deal directly with a stack so if you think, of, so basically before we're calling a function, we're pushing values onto a stack, we call the function, and then we pop the results back off the stack. It's actually pretty easy. So all we're doing here uh, is I'm pushing on a string. So this is kind of in one macro. Um, anything brown here is a macro. You'll see the C API is a lot of macros. 
uh, I'm pushing on a, a converting a C string to Perl, pushing it on the stack. This put back here is simply updating the, the stack pointer variable. Um, I call the argument. Now in terms of the Perl call V, the return value here tells me how many values, were, how many arguments were returned. Because it could be variable, it could be a list. So uh, again, I call this SP again, which again all that's doing is simply updating this stack pointer variable. Um, now I'm, I'm assuming that this uh, value is only going to call one. So here's something important that when you're calling scripting languages from C or really any other language from any other language, you need to be super careful about checking things like, you know, I've got the right number of return variable variables because if I don't pop them all off the stack, the stack is now corrupted. So you're taking your life into hands a lot more uh, doing this sort of stuff. And then again, I can print the, I can pop a string off the stack and print it. Easy. Uh, tickle, again, pretty similar. Um, the, the tickle evaluate object v uh, type of, of function um, takes, a, takes a C array of arguments. So um, I'm really making a list here, which is the function name foo, and then the first function argument, Dave, remember, so it was a prefix notation. I call that. Uh, so it takes an argument as a C array, but similar to Perl, um, the, and it's a single return value, but it's, it's, it's kind of stored in a location. So we simply can get that as a C string or as whatever we want. Now again, here I know it's a string, um, but because it's a scripting language, it'll kind of convert it if it's something else. So at this point, you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa this, is, this is getting a bit crazy. Uh, I mean, it's kind of straightforward, right? But especially when we're looking at that, that, the, the Perl stuff, which is what I do a lot of, uh, it's a lot of stuff, and and you know it's easy to it's easy to corrupt the stack by forgetting something or doing something in the wrong order or the sort of things that that um, uh, you know we're normally hidden from. So, but but like I said, I've, I've I've embedded those three languages in inside you know reasonably significant systems, um, and it turns out that there's there's a, a pattern of approaching it that works works f uh, certainly in the examples I've seen for any kind of embedding a language in another language. Now one, one, exam one case I've, I've dealt with was um, embedding uh, uh, Perl into uh, a C host which already had Tickle embedded and being able to pass them between. And once you've got all set up it works surprisingly nicely. So the structure is this. Uh, you always have to do some kind of runtime interpreter setup because interpreters have you know their state and runtime. Um, you need sort of some functions for this bi-directional data transformation. So like I showed you, there's you know, functions for converting to C strings and things, but that's pretty inconvenient to be doing all the time. Um, so you sort of set up some code to do that for you. Uh, you have to do memory management yourself, of course. Um, make helpers for calling functions, which will also do the data transformation. If you're in an OO language, you can kind of wrap that into an OO base class. So again, you kind of don't have to keep doing it. And if you want to get smart, you can integrate the two runtimes. And if we get time, I'll show you a little bit of that. So that's cool, right? But at this point, you're starting to check your Twitter and think uh, this, that that PHP guy was actually talking some sense. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> you, you, you had to expect to be to be the brunt, I think. Um, so let's uh, let's have a really quick digression and show you a um, an actual demo. Now, I'll just double check for the video people that we are still in. Uh, um, no, this one. Are still in, am I still in 1024 by 768? Oh, okay, good. All right, so here's an actual app uh, that is in development at the moment that has, is an Objective-C app, obviously, it's a Mac app, and uh, it's, running, um, it's running Perl under the hood. So, here we have, uh, now thanks to my client Energy Frontier Services of Texas for letting me use their data. Um, so, okay, so, so, so this is geological data and, uh, and there's, there's you know, hundreds of thousands, probably million, millions of, of data points under there. It's getting loaded by Perl, kind of munged by Perl, passed up to the Objective-C layer for, for pretty displaying. Um, so you may, now, the stuff I've described sounds kind of slow, right? I mean, scripting languages are, are slow anyway, aren't they? Well, let's, 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 let's look. So um, here, I'll just, let me just open up an inspector on this, uh, so this red line here. First, let me pump up the weights so you can see what's going on on the base one here. And I'll just kind of change some colors and things. And every single time that color is changing, 
uh, I'm setting a property in an Objective-C object which is bridged automatically to a Perl object, sets that value, that updates something at the back end, a publish and, subs publish and subscribe message gets generated that triggers the COCO bindings framework which is updating the, uh, the colour on that, on that thing and is then triggering the layer to redraw and doing an open gel re redraw in the background. Uh, and it's pretty fast, right? Um, so, and, and all this stuff here is, is simply bound to uh, Perl properties on an actual data object. Um, so, so what are the values for this? Well, what, one value is that um, there's, the, so for instance, the, the okay, uh, I can look at this, this curve here and I've got these filters now, I don't have any interesting ones loaded here, but um, I can, well actually, let's see, I can add an average filter um, and you can probably see what's happening there. Uh, I can reorder the filters, which won't make any difference in this case. Now, when I added that filter, what that did is that created a Perl object. Stick it, stuck it into an array. That's all it did. And kind of like the, the Angular talk, everything notices that and refilters the data, updates that. So the great thing is that these filters here are Perl modules that are really a single method that's doing some maths on, on an array of points. Um, so it's something that... The, not only can the client write them, but actually the geologists can, uh, can, write, um, you know, can write their own plugins and things like that. Now, I've lost my time because I've gone back there. How, how long have I got? Finish up soon. Okay. So, um, I was going to, uh, uh, no, I knew that I was going to run out of time, like I said. Um, so, let's super quick run through this. So, the setup, you always have to do a little bit of setup um, for any in any embedded language but but there's a bit of a clangor here in the uh, in the in the bottom part the ruby looks nice and small but who can tell me what the problem is there where's the state variable so that i can have multiple interpreters on different threads or even in the same process there is none right so the ruby runtime uses global state so you can't ever have more than one ruby interpreter in a single process you can with both perl and Vertical. Um, that's sort of an example of sort of thing you need to look for. Uh, um, now, th there's just a Perl example here. It looks a bit crazy, but again, in the pattern, you basically have this in every case. You know, we, we have some sort of opaque uh, piece of data coming in from another language, and you just end up with a big case statement, right? Big switch statement, right? C you know, we look at, we call some sort of API. If it's uh, if it's an array, then then we iterate and make an array. If it's a, if it's a number, you know, we turn that into a number. It's, again, pretty straightforward. You do that once, you, you hide that complexity. Memory management, again, pretty easy. Now, this is where Ruby is quite nice. Ruby is very slow for, for, what, for a couple of reasons. One is that the, um, the garbage collector scans the system heap, which means that you don't even have to memory manage your own um, C, C pointers to um, Ruby objects. It does that automatically, which is kind of cool. It's just slow. Um, now, uh, Oh, yeah, help us for calling function. We kind of covered that. Now, object wrappers. Now, a few of you are barfing quietly into your little barf bags there. This is, these are C macros. Um, <laughs> the, uh, my, my take is that when the answer is C macro, macros, you're asking all the right questions. Uh, basically, what this is doing is, is, is code, code generation, right? So, the need, what that's letting us do is that's letting us do things like here. So, all of that crazy stuff we talked about, when I write a, a, an Objective-C class to wrap a Perl class, I'm simply saying synthesize a reessa of type string. Uh, you call this uh, Perl method on the object to get it, and here's the name of the Objective-C method. Sweet. Um, and that's... Oh, and, and I won't cover that. And that's about it. Any questions for Mark? Any questions? So, uh, are you looking at, um, uh, interested in the idea of a language where you could pull that out a bit more automatically in order to generate the, the bindings? I'm thinking of like what Glib's doing with their introspection stuff and lifting right. the GNOME libraries into different languages and stuff. Yeah, so there's, there's I haven't looked at that example. I mean, something that, um, uh, what th there, there, there are things that will kind of try and automate some of that stuff, stuff for you. So Swig is one example, kind of a lower level, and there's other ones. Um, my, uh, so, so I kind of did it, so it's interesting doing it from the ground up, firstly, because it's interesting to talk about, um, but also, um, 
uh, I've just always found those things end up getting really messy, right? Because so I've got some frameworks which hope which which the aim is that they'll get open source, but the reality is no one else will use them because uh, they're kind of tweaked to how it works well for my project. And kind of what I wanted to get across is it's actually not that hard to kind of bootstrap it yourself from from scratch. So I've certainly had those squeaky issues when you're exactly with a bit more complicated too. exactly. Any other questions? Any other questions oh. for Mark? Yep. Excellent. Uh, have you looked at any of the, the tools that will create those mining for The ones I know are the ones in the file and it produces everything that's needed for Haskell to call stuff from C, brings Yeah, yeah, so if you want to do, so actually I didn't, I didn't mention that. So usually when people are talking about kind of um, uh, foreign function interfaces, you, you're kind of usually talking the other way around, right? You've got some kind of nice scripting language as your host and you want to call into C. Now, so if you've got like a C library you want to do that, then those things work kind of great. Um, but yeah, when, when, you, when you want to do things in the reverse direction, um, those tools kind of don't work. And, and also they're, they're kind of aimed at, yeah, you've got, a, you've got a library with a discrete set of functionality, I want to call stuff and get stuff back, rather than really having kind of a live interacting uh, you know, hybrid where I, I'm, I'm hiding the fact that um, you know this, you know this sort of current you know piece of mutated state is is sort of part of my application and developing them both, right? So, so, so this is specifically you know I'm I'm developing both ends of the thing. I'm not just trying to take a static you know library from somewhere and, and import that in. But if that's what you want to do, then 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 those sort of things work great. Okay, I think that's all the time we have. Cool. So, um, if everyone could please thank Mark Offlick for his talk. Yeah.